Okay, welcome to this edition of Guyana Speaks. This edition is called Tourism, Tangible Heritage and the Spoken Word. In this particular segment, we're going to be looking at the built architecture of Georgetown in Guyana. And we're very delighted to have the expertise of Mr. Egbert Carter. He is a retired civil engineer who graduated from the University of Birmingham in the UK with a postgraduate diploma in highway and traffic engineering in 1968 and a master of science degree in transportation and environmental science in 1969. He returned to Guyana in the same year and was employed as an assistant city engineer with the mayor and city council of Georgetown. His interest in the built architecture of the colonial period and the preservation of the same, especially in the capital city, has generated an undying love for the preservation of those edifices that still remain. And we're very grateful as well to have Wayne McQuart. Um, Wayne is well known for his extensive knowledge on the architecture as well of um, Georgetown in Guyana. And he's very kindly produced a PowerPoint to go along with this conversation. Um, and Wayne and Egbert will essentially be holding the conversation and then um, I'll close the conversation when we get to the end. Um, Wayne was also born in Georgetown. He's now retired and lives in London. Most of his working career was with the Shell Group companies, working primarily in information management and IT. And as I say, his current interests, um, passions, I'd actually say, include art and architectural history. So Wayne, but thank you so much. And over to you, Wayne, to start the conversation off. Well, hello, Bert. It's good to be able to meet again. I think we met in Ghana about three years ago, so it's nice to catch up with you. Now, both of you have all been passionate about Ghana's heritage, so particularly the 19th century buildings. So it's very good we have this conversation where we can actually take a walk through Georgetown and have a look at the buildings where they stand now, you know, how they were before and to see how we can actually maintain them and take them forward into the future. So I think we, the plan is to actually take a walk through the Georgetown heritage route, which we probably start somewhere at Stabrook and walk northwards along Avenue of the Republic towards the cathedral. So we have hopefully a leisurely walk looking at these buildings, looking to see what they look like now, reflecting back what they were before and hoping very much that we continue to maintain them. Now you've called them the Magnificent Seven, which are obviously your favorite ones. There's one naughty sibling there, which we probably get to, but then again, we, we deal with that when we come to it. So, okay, we start in, in Georgetown. So I, I've got a brief, um, rough, a rough, very rough map here for you to go through, which obviously, um, sorry, can you get that? Could you see that? It's not quite clear. I'm trying to get that on my screen, a bit big. Oh yeah. So if you want to take us on from there, so assuming we start somewhere around um, Stabrook, which takes us to the public buildings. Mm -hmm. And as okay. you know, the public, the public buildings are really quite important in the sense it starts as the center of where Georgetown actually happened. Because the irony is the building itself obviously contained all the various <coughs> government departments, which in turn spread around the city. So the building itself is a very focal point um, of where we all begin. So, so do tell us where we stand. So take it, take it from here. Okay, then. thank you very much for the introduction. We need to thank you for the very laudable introduction. Like the public building itself was they started in 1829 and completed in April of 1834. It was by Governor Light, who was governor at the time. And in fact, uh, it cost just about 50,000 pounds in those days. Of course, cement, as we know, Portland cement was not invented until 18, 1829. So we didn't have the benefit of concrete foundation. In fact, the building is on a floating foundation of green art logs. And in fact, it's so well built that you don't even see a crack in the building these days. The building itself is a very imposing structure. And uh, I dare say that it was not fenced until 1873. And in 1859, there were pair of cannons from the Crimean War. There were trophies of war that were installed in the front of the building. The, the building itself is very nice in the sense that it, it started off with our present parliament is as a public building. Yeah, it has a very beautiful picture of it before it was fenced in 1873. Yeah. In fact, 
Cassidy, the architect, was a chap by the name of John Hadfield, and the supervisor of works was Mr. Kroll. But in fact, uh, I dare say Cassidy only had his hand in it because the ceiling in the building was his design. I'm much sure Mr. Shavir, Minister of Public Works at the time. Yeah, they a beautiful picture of the ceiling, all hand carved wood. And in fact, what the prayer what had been said that they did in 2011, just after, just before the change of government, he had it replicated in fiberglass. And a portion of it is with the National Trust for safekeeping and a part of memor memorabilia, you know? Yeah, beautiful. Very nice. So would that be, will, Rob, will that be plaster work at the moment now? Would that be the actual reproduction done in plastic? I'm not too sure. Can you, can you no, tell us that it looks pretty well restored? Yeah, they're pretty well done, pretty well done. But this is the original, this right, is the original okay. before. Yeah. Okay, because I think the National Trust in their offices have a few examples of these bits of ceiling, yeah, which exactly. they have on display somewhere up here. Yeah, they kept piece, kept piece of it, yes. Okay. I'll just flash back to this quickly because this shows an example of the old legislative council as it then sat in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. So it gives you an idea of what happened before independence where the government legislature neatly sat around that um, table which looked very um, smart and tidy. <laughs> so there we go from there. That's probably taken somewhere around the 1970s. So we have a slight contrast there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You're right, right, right. Yeah. This is the ceiling, this table that leads up into the first floor. It's a very beautiful ceiling. In fact, it's one of the three buildings in Georgetown that had rotundas. This one, the Barclays Bank and the Park Hotel, all had rotundas. Now, I'm very, very curious about the date of 19, 1832 there. It's, it's significant. It's somewhere within the building period, but it also mm. could stand for the 19, 1832 Reform Act. It could, be, could mean very many things. It could mean the beginning of Georgetown. So that date seems to be very it's open-ended, so to speak. Do you have any idea, you know, why that particular date, 1832? Not really, you know, the city it was, the, Georgia was not declared a city until 1843, right. after the St. George's Cathedral was built, 1832. Right. I'm not sure what that date means, but I know that the building was opened in 1834 by okay. Governor Light. Hmm. In time for emancipation, you know. And perhaps it corresponded with that particular date, because I mean, the city hall obviously is very closely tied up with emancipation, because we've heard, for example, people like Schomburg, where the slaves mm -hmm. were actually sent to the gallows on the grounds outside. At the That's same right. time, when we get to the church across the way, the slaves were the first slaves to be actually admitted into St. Andrew's Church. So that whole area has that close linked with the celebration of um, emancipation. Okay. Okay, and anything else that you want to pick up on the building as such? Not really, no. Yeah. I think it's also worth mentioning that when the first before government house was built, the governors of, had their apartment within the public buildings as well. Oh, as yes, 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 yes. Before they actually moved to a separate house elsewhere, which they had to pay rent for, apparently. Mm. In fact, government house was built in 1852. Right. And this building was called the public buildings because that public offices and the That's post right. office was there, you know. That's right. Okay. We now move from the public buildings, which gives us a panorama of what we, what's ahead of us. We've got St. Andrews, as we can see, then across the road, it takes us down the old High Street Avenue of the Republic. So here we go to St. Andrews Church, which, um, in, you know, it's been with us for some time now and obviously has quite a long history. Mm -hmm. St. Andrews Church is very interesting because, as the data shows, his foundation was laid on the 12th of April, 1811 and completed on the 27th of September, 1818. In fact, the architect shown there is Isaac Hatfield. I've seen where they claim that the architect is also Joseph Hatfield. Joseph, as you recall, was done on the apartment buildings. Anyway, neither here nor there, but the governor who, the, who laid the cornerstone was Governor Bentick, after whom the street is named hence Bentick Street. Yeah, because that's Isaac Hatfield. I've only recently uh, come across the name, really. He may well have been a sibling of Joseph Hatfield because they're just one year apart. So they could well have been part of the same Hatfield family. Could well have been, yes, I think right. so. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful structure. Yeah. The, roof is, the roof is what they call a mansard roof, typical Scandinavian design. But inside the, the ceiling itself is a vaulted ceiling. The building itself is quite, quite a substantive piece of work. 
I did say, I think in the city of Georgetown, it is the most. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because it, can you hear me? Sorry, it appears that those buttresses were put up in the 1940s mm -hmm. to prevent the building. The building was about to not collapse, but they, they're actually act as buttresses holding the building together. So they're quite cleverly buttresses. They're not very, um, you know, they're not mm -hmm. too protrusive. No, 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 they're not. Also oh, taking back, so just taking back slightly. So these are two photographs of the churches. It probably appeared just after the 1850s, 1860s, uh -huh. which gives you a very sort of pastoral landscape of Georgetown, really very rural. Yes, I'd like to say something about the interior of the church. Okay. In fact, if you go to the slide, it shows the interior. Yeah, there you are. There's a gallery. In fact, the slaves after emancipation were allowed into the building and they had to use the gallery. Now the gallery has a very interesting point of view that when the slaves were up there and time for them to say prayers, they built a, a wall at the edge of the gallery that allowed the slaves not to be able to look over to see the plants on their knees as well. It would have been wrong for them to have seen the, the boss so to speak on his knees. <laughs> so that's why you see that, I don't know what you call it, the guardrail or something like that balcony really around the balcony is high enough so that when you kneel you didn't see anything in the floor below. I thought it was very hypocritical but anyway, it does be said. That's just a staircase leading up to the balcony and that's right, that's right. Not a pew. I think it's a nice quiet Sunday morning in Georgetown. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, we move now from St. Andrew's Church, really, which across directly opposite, we cross the road now to, here we come to the Magistrates' yes. Court. Mm -hmm. uh, designed by Castigliani, in fact, it was opened in, in 1891, as you can be seen. But the truth is, there's a very beautiful building. In fact, just recently, they added on much of the architects uh, who did the job recently. He tried to maintain the same kind of decor, so it looks very impressive now. But the building itself is very nice. It's one of Castellani's better works, I dare say. I suppose, is that his only recorded work done in stone? Because I can't think of him doing anything else in stone. He obviously specialized in wood. So this was quite yeah. late, presumably the 1890s. So that would be almost the almost end of his career in Georgetown. Uh -huh. In fact, the very interesting feature about uh, the buildings along that avenue, they're all concrete downstairs on the ground floor and for wood on the first floor. All of them except the hand to hand, which is just a single story building. But it tells me that the, the guys didn't have their homework together with respect to our soil mechanics at this period. So nobody wanted to take a chance. And so Castellani always stuck his neck out when he went to this building to be concrete upstairs and concrete upstairs. In fact, it stays tributed, it's still standing. No cracks, no nothing, you know. Yeah. Yeah, because it's interesting how we have the contrast with the public buildings, which are obviously a stone building built with strong foundations. And then when we come later to St. George's Cathedral, the other thing happened the other way around, where you had a stone building that they put a wooden one up instead. So the contrast, you know, one stood up to the end and the other one was about to fall down and they obviously went for the wooden version rather than the concrete version. That's right. And yeah. uh, maybe you have to enjoy that, I'll tell you some more about that. Yeah. Okay, I'll just put that up as an illustration which links the various buildings together. Um, now, but this particular panorama is very interesting because it was the original was produced sometime in a limited version, which some people have got. But if I remember rightly, this particular version used to be in the old Tower Hotel. That's right, that's right. And nobody seems to be able to remember it, but it's, it gives a very interesting panorama right across, well, the whole of virtually High Street. But I think it was also based on an original drawing, which is not the same thing. So we we'll probably come back to that at another time, but that's just interesting the way one sees the buildings depicted. So as I said, we move across the street now from the Magistrates Court. So we cross Scroll Street and we come to the famous Victoria Law Courts, the High Court as we call it now. Mm -hmm. well, very interesting building because you would say that it was, in fact, your, 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 your little caption there, correct. Brian Van Sikkema was the guy who built it. I feel he was the architect. And Cesar Castellani was also an architect as well. 
And uh, he had a bigger say in the building than anybody else. He would say that the Baron built it, but he didn't have anything to do with architecture, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've just shown the two architectural styles here, where presumably we get the Castellani on the top, the wooden bit, mm -hmm. and the more concrete, perhaps the more medieval design at the bottom. So we get a complete contrast between two architects here. Is that correct? Is, would that be yeah, Joseph right. Hatfield's bottom part of it, and then Castellani on the top? Mm -hmm. In fact, I think Baron Van Sikkema's strength was his, as a civil engineer, you know, because he built the seawall between Kitty and the groin. Right. So I think he had a very strong interest in that particular discipline. That's why he, ca he got captured the ground floor of the building. Castellani did the first floor. Right. I think it's altogether my favorite building still. <laughs> and I still like to call it the Victoria Law Court. It still rings a nice bell. So that's a very old photograph of it there, which gives you an idea of Georgetown as it was then, with note, notes that the canal, canal design, which you probably know quite a lot about as well. Yes, indeed, in fact. That canal was built and was opened by 18, 1909. And in fact, since then, we have not built one iota more of concrete drains. All the sluices from Water Street, in Water Street and High Street, from the Cocodor to High Street, are all concrete channels, every one of them. And when they, when they reached here, they stopped for some strange reason. No more, no more concrete work was ever done, which is sad, really. It's come back to haunt us big time now. But talking a little bit more about, say, about the cathedral, about the our courts. Queen Victoria's statue was blown up, as you probably know, in 1954, after our constitution was suspended. And it went back to London, was repaired, and came back again. You see, she on the pedestal is three meters high. And then when, 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 they, when they blew it up in 1954, they circumcised the pedestal, and now it's almost only one meter. Here yeah, she's been removed to the bottom mirror to be sent to the back of the gardens. In fact, I'm very proud to tell you that I was responsible for reciting it in 1994. Again, Ben Queen Elizabeth II was visiting. Uh, we had a, an interest in getting back to the this right location. And the Grand Martin was able to achieve it. Anyway, this, this takes you back to when the Jubilee statue was being unveiled, which, yeah, uh, which, which, which contradicts the meme when people say we want to get rid of Victoria. Here is the dawning crowd, you know, standing here waiting for unveiling. So way back. It was 18, 1894, with the Jubilee, when people gathered before. And this was a little etch, um, etching which came, I think, from a London newspaper. So it just shows the crowd there all being very proud of the Queen Victoria statue then. Probably not now, but anyway, that's another story. Yeah, that picture was the 4th of September, 1894. And the itself was opened on the board the 4th of May, 1887, 50 years on the corner. Yeah, so just picking up now on some of the architecture. Mm -hmm. that's, um, that's that gallery just overlooking High Street. Western uh, Front, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. And then that's more, the more detail of Castellani's architecture. Mm -hmm. yeah, see. It's such a combination yeah. of everything there, isn't it? In fact, you know, they built another structure to the east of this particular property. And I'd like to give the architect, the engineer, a guy named Anandari. He was a civil engineer, but he made sure that the building that he put up imitated this building faithfully with respect to the architectural details. You couldn't tell that that building was built just about 1998, 1999, compared to this building which was built in the 1800s. But the architecture follows faithfully the kind of decor you see there. Yes, that's fine. It's a shame I haven't got a photograph of that here, but it, as you said, it's quite correct. I was quite surprised they kept so faithfully to the original design. Um, yeah. And it, just, it just shows we have the will. We can do things if we have the will, you know. Yeah, of course, yeah. So this is just some of the interior of the building. Well, I think that's one of the courtrooms and just sort of the structure around the staircase. And you get these trefoils appearing everywhere, don't you? Even in the wooden work and even on the, I think, some of the fences as well, the stonework on the That's palings, right. on the work outside That's the building. Right. So they seem to appear everywhere in the architecture as well as they, mm -hmm. in the grounds as well. Some are quadrifiles, some are trefoils. Yeah. They very seem to, be, seem to be very popular in the design, design of the time, you know? You have mm -hmm. another. Yeah, there's another ceiling that reflects Castellani's work 
That's in right. The five yeah, I think that appears just in the main staircase, and this. So that's rather beautiful staircase because you've got the Victorian tiling and then you've got all the ironwork coming coming down really. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, every building we look at, we probably notice ironwork becomes a general theme. They seem to pick that up all the way through. So whereas one's more conscious of seeing ironwork associated with brick buildings, it's good to see in Georgetown where a lot of wooden buildings have actually incorporated the ironwork as well. And of course, it's interesting to know how this ironwork got there, where it came from. And the amount of skill and sort of artistry and decorative work that was put into efforts to make it. And of course, the ironwork is interesting in the sense that where the wood rots and, mm -hmm. and the concrete sinks, the ironwork in Ghana never seems to have rusted somehow. It seems to maintain that quality. Whereas in some of the islands in, in the Caribbean, for example, where they've got ironwork, it tends to get rusted by the salt air. So it's nice to think that most of the ironwork in Georgetown has been preserved as it is. And most of the ironwork is cast iron, which doesn't rust easily, you know. Okay. Cast iron doesn't rust easily. In our environment, not yeah. like in the Caribbean, you have a lot of salt here. Okay. We're not exactly close to the ocean, you know. But I, I just love these old buildings, you know, and the thought that so much of the stuff came in from Britain, especially wrought iron work, like the kissing bridges in the Botanic Gardens. And those bands yeah. that all came in from sort of southern England and from Scotland. Yeah. And in the case of this high court, it's nice to think that people are, can just wander in from the road and walk around to some extent. And of course, how many people actually appreciate the building itself? They probably come and come and go but for different reasons, but they never probably look around to see the detail in the in the architecture. I think anybody yeah. visiting the high court would probably have a matter of interest <laughs> in the court, so they don't have time to think about that. Indeed. Indeed, and those who go around cameras probably get prohibited by the security guards anyway. So. <laughs> okay, we move along now um, along um, Avenue of the Republic, and we come to the famous town hall, city hall, as we well know it. Well, what more can one say? It's still the most beautiful building in Ghana, the whole of the Caribbean, but here we are. We're not quite sure what it looks like now to those of us who are not there, but you probably best know how to describe it. And in fact, as, as the thing says, the architect, his father scholars, he did a lot of the work. In fact, he did the ceiling for the Big Dam Cathedral, the one that burned down in March of 1913. And in fact, there's a ceiling, there's a hammer beam finish, as they call it. He obviously was a structural man, you know, but uh, I don't cast it, and he had not much interest, he had no interest in this particular building, I thought, no input rather. But it was opened in July 1st of July 1889. I often wonder what it could have been like that year, you know, because first of July you have this building being open, then you have the <clears throat> cornerstone being laid for St. George's Cathedral, and the next year you had the Demerara Mutual building being open. So, you know, it must have been fascinating to be a resident of the city and see all this action taking place. Yes, one never really thinks. I mean, that must be quite exciting. I mean, I know buildings going up in Georgetown now, there's no great excitement because you probably see boxes going up surrounded by steel girders and glass. But I could just imagine what it was like in that time with the scaffolding being very higgledy piggledy as it probably was. And these various bits of wooden architecture being put together. And, and so it must have been quite an interesting period for those who were able to observe it and probably those who were able to write about it. Exactly. In fact, in fact, I worked on this building in, as a young engineer, trying to make sure that we preserved it. In fact, the reason why it's still standing is because the tower is what it literally tower strength, you know. It's a beautiful building. <clears throat> and in fact, they had some youngsters from out to the UK came and they did a very detailed architectural perspective of the building. So we have the record to show. If we need to be able to do any more remedial work, we have records to show, you know. <clears throat> that which shows the city engineering department, which shows the, okay, let's stay with that. This is the, this is the state leading up to the, in the tower. In the main city hall building itself. So those staircases were designed by schools as well, or could be any, any carpenter presumably working under him? I think, I think they would have been done by scholars, you know, because as a young engineer, I did see the drawings for this building in the city engineering department. In 1969. I went back looking for them a couple of years after I couldn't find anything. I don't know whether they preserve it, whether they just, just destroyed more the latter, I think. It's very sad because the building was constructed by uh, Sprostons Limited and the 
the, the supervisor, a guy named Luke Hill. In fact, a couple of years ago, I was invited by the mayor at the time, Alton Green, to be on a committee myself. They had granted the single charge out of and bought with me to see how we could start the rehabilitation of the building. And they did a lot of work with respect to the levels and making sure that the building where it was plumb and where it wasn't plumb and things like that. But the truth is, uh, I was asked to leave the, the compound by town clerk. I don't know why, but after that time, in, in May 2013, I never went back. But the building itself is in a very poor shape, a very, very poor shape. I don't know if we're waiting for it to fall down or what. Yes, these are just some of the awful state where, I mean, this existed way back in 2010. So it just goes to show it's been in a bad state for a very long time and probably has got worse since then, of course. Very much so, very much so. Wayne. And nobody seems to be willing to do anything, you know. Yeah, because it means probably reaching a stage now where parts of it have to be recomplete, you know, completely rebuilt again. But I mean, that itself will be obviously money, which it's going to take somebody's got to find it from somewhere, but hopefully they will find the money. You know, taking examples from the other work that's been done, on, you know, elsewhere. You know, as I tell people, I think this the last government, the, the PNC Upham government, they're very, I thought they were very cultural, you know, David Granger being historian. No, but it's very important it comes back again because most of us the remember. The government, the PP, they're very agricultural, they're a bit of farm to market, what the voice is. I mean, going back to the Sorry. auditorium itself, I mean, it's a very special place culturally within Guyana because yes. at the time, apart from the assembly halls, this was the only main function room in Georgetown for the concerts and various things. People have taken music exams there and various cultural activities. And going back to that wonderful hammer beam roof, it's, it's quite unique in Georgetown. So it, it must really must be preserved, really, surely. Mm -hmm. So we hope they take heed to this. Uh, making the point that the PNC government seems to be very cultural, but they, they seem to be very do <laughs> They didn't have a pocket. There's the PP government, they're very agricultural. I don't think they care to roots, <laughs> frankly. Okay, then. So the sister building next door, as you, as you said, is the architecture, <laughs> city, city yeah. engineer's office, yes, yeah, which is a, a nice enough it's building a, in itself, too. It's a fine, fine structure. In fact, I don't know who designed it, but the truth is it ended up being the fire station. Up to the 18, 19, 23, when it was moved to the present location by Starbuck Market. But the fire tenders, there you are, the fire tenders, they were always under the city hall they, when they were animal drawn years ago. And then they moved into a building in the same compound with the city engineer department. And then eventually they moved and went on to High to Wall Street by the Starbuck Market. Because I think they mentioned in the 1945 fire, they said the fire engines had moved so far away from the center of the city that they weren't readily at hand when the fire took place. So it must have moved by then, presumably, to the Stabrook site. Yeah, yes, they, they, they moved in 1923. Right. So that's the building. It's a rather beautiful building. Mm -hmm. But that seems to be fairly well maintained in terms of structure. It's obviously managed by the same municipality, so I can't see why they left, let one go without the other. Well, in fact, it was just recently done over about two, two or three years ago. They had a complete makeover. So that, that lasts for the next 50, 60 years if they maintain it. But City Hall itself is on its, on its last, it's on its way out, if you don't mind me saying that. But I hope that as it says, it doesn't reach, we can preserve it, you know? Yeah. There we have the Russell Memorial, which had its ups and downs as well, moved from one place to the other. In fact, I, this is one of my objectives, you know. I'd like to see this statue where it belongs. It was parked in a place called Russell Memorial, a triangle piece of land in front of by the Starbuck Market, slightly south of Starbuck Market. And in fact, in the bottom time, they moved and put in what they call the dread shop. But this guy was responsible for bringing water from the conservancy to the city of Georgetown. William Russell, was born in Scotland, died in Guyana. He, for me, is one of our greatest uh, people. He brought the water from the conservancy into Georgetown. Yeah. What we consider to be sheltered at home. But his statue should be where it belong. It belongs to what they call the Russell Memorial Square. Not that city engineering department. Right, yeah. Okay, yes, yeah, so because it in itself is a very fine bit of Victorian monumental architecture in itself, really, isn't it? So let's hope we, so we hold on to it. Okay, mm -hmm. now moving further down High Street, um, another 
illustrated drawing here, which takes us northwards. So we move from the city hall across Regent Street, which brings us to the building we know as the Demerara Mutual Building, which is on the corner mm -hmm. of Rob and High Street. Yeah, it was opened in January, 1st of January, 1892. And in fact, they see the downstairs are concrete, and the two floors above are wooden, just like City Hall and the structures we looked at just now. So that just transitions. the private sector can do, but it's very well maintained compared to some of the other buildings, you know. Everything in the raw time is still intact, not a piece missing, not a piece broken. And of course, it's ironic again that that's remained a wooden building, whereas the other two insurance companies on the other side of the road are actually built in concrete, which preserved them from the ravages of the Georgetown fire. So at least this building, <laughs> as an insurance building, has managed to survive the, um, the any any damage from fire. You know, it was, it was funny about that. But the two insurance buildings across the road are both single-story buildings. They don't have any upper story. Right. You no. Know, so it just goes to show maybe. Guys okay, were hedging their bets. <laughs> they didn't want to take any structure with wood. Well, we had two very bad fires, one of 1829, one of 1862 and 1864. And it's the fire of 1864 that created the genesis of insurance companies. Right. Both the Mutual and the hand the itself. And then you go down a little further, it was opened in 1879. 1879. And then from that, they created the Mutual in 1892. So that's why it probably is at the moment with the concrete. And I'm not sure how up to date this photograph is probably not as uh, modern as it should be, but anyway, it gives you an idea of the concrete bottom, which. I remember I did the badge in the center of the building from celebrating the 120th year. So it's 2012. That photograph would have been after 2012. Right. So that iron portico is still in place, is it, as far as you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Still here, yes. Right. Still okay. Here. And the fence, the fence is still there in pristine glory. Here yeah, are this 18, this one's 1879 the hand in hand building, and it cost about 2,000 Ghana dollars at the time to build. The tower in the back is a Beckwith Hotel, which eventually ended up being the GPO. Right. Hmm. Quite an interesting building. This is one of the better kept buildings in Georgetown. You guys pay no effort to maintain it, you know. And in fact, when it's in, when it's in the public hall, it's very well lit, very beautifully lit. Yes, this was a photograph taken in 1935 of the, um, it was illuminated for the Jubilee of George the first, the 25th Jubilee of George the fifth. Um. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, the high street, or the Avenue of the Republic, as we know it, was the first street to be lit when electricity came to Georgetown in 1891. In fact, the roadway from from Victoria, of course, right after the sea was lit by electricity. So you can see that these are beneficiaries of the product, you know. Beautiful building, still well maintained. And that fabulous iron work there again, which obviously is very quite decorative and very sturdy, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. The right time work again. Yeah. Okay, now that takes us right across back to the other side of the road, back to um, I suppose we now are we now in Cum Cummingsburg still, or is that still Rob Town? No, this is still be Cummingsburg. This is now Cummingsburg proper, right? Okay, mm -hmm. that takes us over to St. George, a beautiful structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is, one of the this is one of the latest photographs taken. So I think this is after the restoration after this in 1912, last year, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful building now. It's, very, very, it's got a couple, a couple more years well on this belt now because a lot of work was put into it, a lot, a lot of work, a lot of thought. In fact, you probably know the architect, Arthur Bloomfield, never came to Guyana. <laughs> I think he built it by remote control because he was afraid of yellow fever and smallpox, some of the things that threat all the time. He had the coronavirus to deal with now, but he, he was afraid of the smallpox and yellow fever. So he never came. And in fact, the first building that was done was all, well, no, the first, the first building, yes, was a wooden structure measuring center by Torre and built where the St. George's School is. 
and that has now been, yeah, there it is, there it is. It's now recited at Providence opposite the police station. That's the original St. George's Church, built in 1810. And removed and recited at that new location. So that makes it well, the, old, well, the oldest building probably in Georgetown, is that correct? Well, it's well over 200 years now, which obviously surpasses anything else. I would say the oldest building in Demerara, yeah. in Georgetown, in Georgetown itself, the oldest building would be St. Andrew's Cook, 1818. Right. No, it's remarkable to think it survived um, the actual. So did they actually dismantle it bit by bit or was it moved in some way? They must have dismantled the, the structure as such. Yeah. Well, I was able to determine it was moved and moved. They dismantled it and moved it in Drakeart up to the present site to reassemble it. And right. In fact, I take a very active interest in this, the structure and doesn't need any work at all. Right. There was some work to be done on the inside which has since been corrected. But it's the original building, 70 feet by 30 feet. Gosh, yes. Simple. And then that takes us to this, the second cathedral, which was... Yeah. Well, actually, they decided in 1838, when this building, when the first building was moved, to move, to build this, this structure. This structure is built out of stone. And you can see the tower in front, which is the western part of the building, built in the present location, was so heavy that it caused the structure to fail. So they had to move out. In fact, whilst they were building this building, people attended the church at Christ Church in Waterloo Street nearby. The congregation was held over there. But this building failed. They had to take it down in 1877. In the meantime, they built a poor cathedral, which is on, in Carmichael Street, just nearby. That's a poor cathedral, that's right. Built and opened in 1877, and they used up until 1892. Then they moved back into the present cathedral. Now, Bert, do we know the actual site of this building? Was it actually on the corner of Carmichael Street? It was roughly where they all. So it's supposed to be halfway in the block between Church Street and Common Street, or the old, was formerly called Murray Street. Right, okay. It's just immediately south of the present Bishop's High School. On the corner of Church and Church Street and Carmichael Street is the SBCK bookshop. So was this completely dismantled, this stroke dismantled afterwards as well? It seemed, it seemed quite functional sort of building to continue. It, it was, but I couldn't tell you exactly what happened eventually, but I know it's not there now. Yeah. Okay, then that takes us obviously to the the new cathedral, which obviously appeared like an Elizabethan building at that particular period of time before it um, got stripped of all those black bands. In fact, this building, I, I never seen it like this, but I do know what photographs would look like. In fact, this is one of the inherent weaknesses of the design. But with all the timber exposed, the plasterboard, as we call it today, was on the inside. The right. moisture tantalized the structure, you know. So eventually they changed and they put on the green arch facade all around the four corners of the building. But it must have been quite a spectacle to see it in that shape. In fact, the present, this, this present cathedral was opened in 1892, January, January 1st, 1892. And it cost 34, uh, no, it cost 50,000 pounds at the time. Yes, that's quite splendid. Um, well, that's taking us back just a couple of years back, what part of the cathedral looked like. <laughs> and oh, it's amazing to think that that's all gone. And for example, all that rock work has been actually remodeled and replaced, which is a remarkable tribute oh, to yeah. the skill and carpentry of the people in Guyana. And I believe even the hoppers have been replaced and remodeled. So it just goes to show the skills are actually there to be employed and utilized. So. Let's hope the City Hall will take a leaf out of the book that the Anglican Church has managed to produce this magnificent um, restoration. So it can be done. So it's proof here. Well, you know, the guy, the guy who did this work was the guy who I met with him. He, he did over the bishop's house at the corner of Barrack, uh, Barrack and High Street. Right. And, he did, and we brought him over to the church here. And I'm hoping that life, his life could be reserved so we could bring him over to the City Hall whenever the guys choose to find the money, you know. But no, we have the skills. I mean, I, I took an active interest in the rehabilitation of this particular structure. I'm pleased to tell you, first time I ever saw a guy using ads. And, you know, they, they use the original equipment to get some of the shapes. A beautiful building, beautiful building indeed. The chandelier was a very gift from Queen Victoria. And the time was done by Sprostons. 
the pulpit to the left is donated by Robert Michael Jones, the guy who owned Jonestown Agricola, as we know it today, the Agricola Village. Quite a history, quite a very impressive history about this building. Now, is it all, just all, yeah. all the stained glass to replace? Yeah. It's really fantastic, really incredible. Mm -hmm. mm. Of course, we've never been able to open it officially because of the coronavirus. There has they, they been services being held there, but everything with social distancing, you know. And we hope one day when, when, when the coronavirus would have departed, we could have a proper uh, re, re, re opening of the building, you know. Yeah, I believe they want to fence the cathedral again, which would be a pity in a way, because apparently they get lots of vagrants hanging about the premises now. So they feel that they, at one time there was a fence around apparently, but um, and they want to reinstate that again. So let's hope they keep it open as, you know, as far as possible, because I think that'll actually keep people out, so to speak. Um, yeah, it's, it's such a haven in the centre of the city to be able to go there and have a quite peaceful reflection, even though the traffic is humming around you most of the time. So, I hear you, I hear you, and agree with you. So there we are in all its splendor. Mm -hmm. Beautiful indeed. Anyway, both we've come to the end of that particular stretch. I mean, one could obviously go back and recount and look back. There are obviously other buildings around, but obviously these are the ones which are still around, which hopefully will still be there for the foreseeable future. There's no reason why they shouldn't be. and. Um, there again, some of the wooden architecture, although it has difficulty in keeping up the maintenance of it, we all know the cost of it, it can be done because ironically, the churches have managed to survive more than anyone else. If one looks at the churches in, in New Amsterdam, I believe mm -hmm. Scots Church, which is another wooden building. Well, ironically, all the Presbyterian churches have done pretty well because when you consider St. Andrew's, St. Thomas's mm -hmm. and Scots Church, I mean, touch of wood, they're all, all wooden buildings dating back nearly 200 years. And um, mm -hmm. it's only the Catholic churches that have done pretty badly. St. Mary's obviously went up in flames. And then of course you had Sacred Heart going up in flames. So mm -hmm. I suppose the thing is no, no candles in churches, no lights. That's one, one, one thing to remember. But no, it just goes to show you these buildings can be maintained. There's no reason why they couldn't continue indefinitely into the future. We've seen the St. George's little church in Providence and mm -hmm. we've got the cathedral here and we've got everything else. So I think we should really continue to look after them and cherish them for what we've got. You didn't make any mention of Starbuck Market, which is quite a unique structure. That, to, to the best of my knowledge, is well maintained as well, you know, Starbuck Market. Well, he, well yes, as um, Scholes described it, it's the work mm -hmm. of a metal smith and a tin smith. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting reading Scholes in these buildings because he doesn't actually mention architects by name, but you can read between the lines of things, because uh, as you probably know, Scholes is very much a purist architect. And I think mm -hmm. he, looked, he didn't look down at engineers, but he saw engineering as a different function altogether. And he thought the two disciplines should be kept separate. And occasionally they came together. And I think he acknowledged that in one, two buildings. But otherwise, he said the architect knows his place and the architect he describes as the poets and the engineers as the prose writers or something else. But he had this disparity between the two professions. But I think in the end, I think he, between the lines, he, he had admiration for both. But he thought they should be kept separate. They were two separate professions. You know, one thing I regret is that we seem to have lost a lot of Caesar Castellan and his work. Have we lost the arms, or the arms also, as we know it today, as yeah. Castellan and his work, and we also lost the hospital in New Amsterdam, New Amsterdam right. which is his yeah. work. Is I right. believe he even designed the bar in Demco. Apparently, there was a, a bar designed by him in Demco House. That's right, the bar of State, the sports bar. That's he right. Was, uh, he had a hand in that, yes. Yeah, so I think fact, he, he, he really he did the car shed of the government house as well. Yeah, yeah, he really needs a proper memorial, actually, because we've got Castellani House, which I don't think really gets associated with Castellani, the person. It's just mm -hmm. become Castellani, Castellani House, the art house. So I think one actually needs something more, you know, we've got Hatfield Street and we've got other streets. There's no reason why we can't name a street after Castellani. It has a nice tone as well, Castellani Street. So I think we should really get Castellani back on the map again, really, because I mean, he's done so much really for the architecture in Georgetown, particularly, not only that, he built most of the institutional buildings, arms houses, the, build, the police, police station was built by him as well. So we got mm -hmm. the Brickdown Arms House, the used to the Queen's College. We got the Palms, we got the police station, we got the New Amsterdam Hospital. 
And of course, we've got the Castellani house on the St. John Road. So his legacy has been really quite tremendous, really. So one should really, apart from having just said Castellani house, something a bit more distinctive to recognize him. So if Guyana does decide to take down any more statues, perhaps they can put one up to Castellani. We haven't got a photograph of him, but we, no, know, no. He lived, we know he lives at 64 Middle Street, so we perhaps put a blue plaque on the house, which if it's still there. Yeah, I think so, I hope so. You actually, in yeah. terms of Castellani, um, how did he end up there? I mean, I'm assuming he's an Italian. Did they, in terms of the architects in, in Guyana, were they just brought in specifically to build all of these amazing buildings or were they people that lived there and, you know, had other lives other than being sort of contracted architects? No, Castellani was a priest, was a, was a Jesuit priest. He was a priest. And I think he was basically, he was basically Maltese, we really, but although he studied in Italy. And then he came exactly. to Guyana in 1860. And I think he worked as a Jesuit priest for a while and he got sort of seconded into the department, engineering department, when he worked on the Sikama. And he was a very mm -hmm. good draftsman. And of course, he then sort of went from being a sort of priest into architecture because he also got married. Did he marry a Guyanese person perhaps? Yes, that's right. And they got married in, in um, the church in Main Street. <clears throat> So he obviously so, settled yeah. down there, and I think afterwards, I think he went to Barbados. He, I think one of his last buildings built in, a church built in Barbados. So it must have been interesting that, um, as I said, there's a house in 64 Middle Street where he lived. Mm -hmm. Because the interesting thing is that um, J.B. Sharp was lived in Middle Street as well. So they must have been contemporaries. So it's interesting to know, you know what went on between these various architects, because they were the same generation. Mm -hmm. Especially where you get iron work being used in all the different buildings, how iron work was brought into the country, how it was used, how it was used. So it, mu it must have been quite an interesting period to read about it, but we haven't got the records and we haven't got a photograph of um, Castellani. So we just have to go. We got a photograph of Mr. Scholes, what he looks like, mm -hmm. but we don't know what Castellani looks like. But no, certainly he must have been quite an important um, person as well, because he also played the organ apparently in the church as well. So he's obviously you know, quite a good all rounder. Mm -hmm. Word. I must, give, I must give you credit for having your history right. <laughs> if you don't mind me saying so, we okay. take all the fact you related. Bert, let me ask you: of all the new buildings going up in Georgetown, is there one that has impressed you, or uh, uh, have all of them been um, buildings that you 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 shudder? Well, you know, the truth is, everybody's moving to what they call the modern architecture structures with glass wrapped around them. But the truth is, they don't reflect anything about anything indigenous or typical of Guyanese. You know, I, I think that's very sad. In fact, a lot of travesty because uh -huh. the New Building Society built a building at the corner of North Street and uh, North Street and uh, Avenue the Republic, which hides the cathedral. In fact, one of the things that the city council was interested in or the National Trust, that there should be no buildings to hide the architecture of the cathedral. You know, you should be able to see it from anywhere, in any part of the city. But now you can't. If you walk you know, high street, you don't see it until you reach in front, in front of the building, you know, because somebody was allowed to build a, a structure down there. Mm. But I'm really not too impressed with any of the buildings, but no, frankly, I like our wooden heritage, man. Of course, mm. of course. Well, I must give some credit to the buildings they built in Georgetown during the 1950s. I mean, the Georgetown replan after the fire was fairly, oh, yes. was fairly sympathetic to the past. It was fairly well planned. And if you notice, all the buildings that they did, they even not acknowledged the old towers. If you look at the Booker's Universal, Samet Parker, the post office, even oh, though they were very flat modern buildings, very much like Le Pousier and the Bar, the Bar House, they always mm -hmm. had these little tiny towers, which the architects actually reflected that back to things like the post office tower and the old tower from the RACS building. So I think it's very well, they were, they were very, very good modern architecture that period. And it's good to think that some of them are still around. They haven't actually rebuilt any of them, but, um, but there we are. There's some good stuff around from the 1950s. But I usually said the last bit of architecture work for many Guyanese was St. Stanislaus College. That was built in 1926 by a Guyanese architect by the name of Mr. Also, After that, I don't think you've seen anything worth it, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> frankly. Is that uh, Ed Edgar's family? I, I would think so, you know. I don't, I've never been able to trace it, but. All the middle houses, I think, are related. Okay. One way or another, you know. But he was the architect who did St. St. Stanislaus College. And that was in 1926. After that, I don't see any building that I think about that I could put in a category 
of all built heritage. Mm. So who, who do you think had the, the, the biggest influence on, on the architecture then in, in um, Georgetown? I mean, in terms of the design, is it, you know, cause I, I can see the, from some of what you were saying, there was a large Scottish presence um, but you know, is it sort of Scottish, Dutch, is it English? Like most of the buildings that you've, you've gone through there, which was the mm -hmm. European power that had the most influence on the design? Mm -hmm. I, I think myself that I think Castellani had the biggest intention. He did a lot, a lot of buildings in his time. And I think the other guy who did a lot of work too is Miss Wins, Wins, Wins relative, John Bradshaw Chapels. He left us with a nice legacy of Chinese architecture houses. Yeah, the building in Duke Street, the building in Pocha Street, and the one in Ornock, Ornock, and uh, Ornock and then Irish Street. Yes, all Sharples buildings. I think yeah, Wayne knows a little about Sharples, don't you, Wayne? Yeah, I think a lot of these buildings <clears throat> really not this. They brought <clears throat> they drew different styles really. Wayne one thinks of the Renaissance and the, the Gothic. Mm -hmm. So when you come to Castellani and Scores, they were coming from a very at that time the 19th century architecture in Britain was very Gothic revival. So, so what, <clears throat> sorry, what we've got in Ghana is really Gothic revival to some extent. And of course, Castellani being, having an Italian influence, obviously brought in that Italian style to his buildings, which including <clears throat> the towers you see in Lombardy, those square towers. And when it comes to Sharples, we don't, <clears throat> his stuff is very, very eclectic. He obviously picked up stuff from anywhere. So but it's very interesting reading Scholes again. It's interesting reading Scholes when you think of the Sharples work, because I think Scholes may have been very sort of, he didn't like all that frippery, all that fretwork and that fancy stuff. Although he never really mentioned oh, architects by name, one wonders whether he had Sharples in mind as well. What's what Scholes' background? Is he is he Dutch or? Oh, no, but Scholes was his father was an architect and he was an architect as well. Although he was a Jesuit priest. I see. So he came with it from the, you know a strong architectural background. So he was very much an architectural purist in the sense that at that time, obviously, nineteenth century everything classical was fine. Anything goth, going back to the Gothic was fine. So you had somebody who was very much an architect. And I think similar to Castellani, they were actually trained architects. Whereas mm -hmm. Sharples, as we probably know, I don't think he was a trained architect. He may have been a good draftsman. And he was very good at put, he was a very good businessman putting the buildings together. But he didn't have that, as far as I know, that architectural training per se. Because funny enough, Rory Westmus was desperately trying to get hold of his drawings. Ah. Because when he saw the Sharples buildings, he couldn't understand how a man who was an architect was able to put them together. Mm. But we could never find, we never had any little drawings, so we really couldn't um, track that back. No, no. So presumably really? most of these wooden buildings are, are built with green heart uh, wood mm. or? Yes, green heart, <clears throat> pitch pine. They used, because I think a lot of the, the, the fretwork was done in some of the softer wood. Mm. Whereas green heart, I think was, I don't think that wasn't really used all that much, Bert, was it? I think they used a lot of pine, Canadian pine. In fact, if I could just butt in there, people think that because St. George is wooden, because you had a lot of wood in Guyana. In fact, the irony is that over 1 million BM of wood was imported, pine wood was imported from Canada, finished that building, St. George's Cathedral. Over 1 million BM of wood. But to come back to Sharples, he did the Bishop's House at the corner of Barrack Street and Avenue de Republic High Street. I think it's very, very nice building. It's just being maintained. Really, really, very, very, very well done over. Mm. That, that's really um, fascinating, Egbert, because uh, Rod and I were in uh, Inverness in a place called um, Cromarty. And um, we Scotland. were in Scotland, yeah. And we'd be, we we're being shown around Scotland by the Scottish historian David Alston. And he was showing us where. Um, some of the buildings and some of the area by the um, sea um, had been used, they'd used um, green heartwood and it's still there today. But it's fascinating that the Scots had gone to Guyana to import green heartwood into Scotland while also meanwhile for a Scottish church, presumably importing the wood from Canada. <laughs> That's it. You know, thing, we, didn't have, we didn't have the technology at the time because green heartwood is very hard wood, you know. Yeah. In fact, I used it very, very hard work to work, but we didn't have the skills. So I think that's why they imported a lot of it. But no, the present structure, the present St. George's, has had green art wood covering the entire external walls. I think they'll last me and a lot more like me myself. 
So I, I'm assuming that um, most of these buildings um, would actually have been constructed by um, the enslaved Africans or by indentured people, or who, who was actually, who were the people involved in actually building Workers. the structures? Oh, I, I think myself, the, the group of slaves that took were settled in the area, you know, some called Winkle, Winkle Settlement. Yeah. Those are slaves who all had skills, whether they were coopers or plumbers or masons or whatever, you know, or shoemakers, like, you know, some of the streets in, in New Amsterdam, shoemakers, shoe, shoe lane, Cooper Avenue, Cooper, Cooper Street. But no, a lot, of, a lot of the skills were available and a lot of skills are still there at the moment, as, as very evident in the research of the cathedral. Yeah, because they were described as government servants, weren't they? They were paid a sum of money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there was no Winkle equivalent in Georgetown, was there? They were obviously New Amsterdam in the Winkle settlement, but there wasn't anything equivalent in Georgetown? We don't know, of course. No, but I think it would be easy for them to come now to town if they had a skill that was required. But what do you think? Yeah. I mean, that yeah. is not from abroad. I would have thought they had people they could hire out who had particular skills that they probably, you know, hired out in that way. I, I wondered if you could say as well a little bit a bit more about um, how they accommodated, how they shaped the architecture in order to accommodate the um, climate. You know, for example, when you look at the jealousies and the type of windows, I understand they used to put ice in, in, in like in these uh, in, in the window yeah. area to allow the rooms to cool. I mean, if you could say something about that. Yeah, in fact, in fact, I think I, a lot of credit is due to Rory Rasmus in that particular aspect. Rory has, Rory has a paper he called Building or Architecture in Our Sun. And in fact, when the boats left here with rice to go to Barbados, they came back empty. They come back with an empty vessel, it makes it very unstable in rough weather. So they load up with ballast. They load up with a lot of white marl. The white marl was used to build roads in our boys' tomb. Then afterwards, they started moving it with ice. And so that's where the guy got some of his ice from. His ice came out of Canada, but sometimes from Barbados, that's why he called the guy ice out the DIH. Anyway, the jealousy came about because the, the, the plantation owners could buy blocks of ice, put it in the, in the cooler, as they call that structure with the demolition shutter, put a sugar bag over it, and by raising the sash window behind it, and the air blowing over the sugar bag covering the block of ice, was there some kind of air conditioning effect. <laughs> but that, that's the origin of the demolition shutter, I'm told. Oh. So, so I guess it was, um, so they had the, um, there was that area where they used to produce ice, you had to go and buy the ice from there and then you'd put it in the, in your, in the window, in the jealousy box and then, is that right? I, used to, I had stories but I wasn't sure how accurate. Yeah, are, right. mm -hmm. yeah, one could just wonder the mechanics of the whole thing, this ice had to be transported to a local residence. It obviously has because it was mostly in the bedrooms, I would assume, that where the ice was actually done for cooling. So mm -hmm. the ice would have to be then taken up flights of stairs to be put in the coolers. Then the question, how often was the ice changed? Who did the changing? Was it all the servants? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting topic to, when you consider air conditioning, you know, how long does a block of ice last in the tropics, for example? How many blocks of ice do you bring in the house each day? Who is it can afford to buy a block of ice every day? So this, it's a very interesting idea of how it all sort of started and how it was made sustained. Yeah, yeah. then the one last um, comment, I think before we close um, is, I, I just thought it was very interesting, but um, your comment about the uh, St. Andrew's Kirk and the, and the section um, that slaves were allowed to go into, the fact that they couldn't actually see the masters uh, they weren't allowed to see the master sort of kneeling. <laughs> um, and it just made me think about, oh, that's, you know, how architecture was shaped in that way to cater for the population as well, you know, to, to you know, reflect the hierarchies in society. I thought that was so fascinating. Um, but presumably mm -hmm. a lot of the planter class hadn't really wanted the enslaved people to be allowed into churches in any way or to, or to be given a, a religious... A religious education. Because this but, pro probably means the Presbyterian churches built the balconies, because if you think of the Catholic churches and the Anglican churches, I don't think there are any galleries in those churches, are there? And it's the Presbyterian churches in New Amsterdam, various places, we've got the old balconies, which are probably designed specifically for the lesser man, you know, the common man, so to speak. Whereas there's nothing in St. George's, nothing in the Catholic cathedrals, or any other, other Catholic churches, as far as I know, because they were getting, oh, 
Yeah, I think Christchurch has a balcony. Yeah, but don't forget we they came a lot long, long after 1834, you know. Yeah. 1834 was a terrible time. In fact, you don't know that the governor like to read two proclamations, one for the male and one for the female slaves who were to be uh, manumitted, you know. People don't realize that it's a the agenda equality foremost in the start. <laughs> Sorry, say that again, but what do you mean? And so in, they, they, they manumitted the women before the men, or? No, they, no, in fact, people think if you read a, a manumission for the slaves, you read one. In fact, Governor Light read two, one for male and one for female slaves. So nobody could say that male slaves were exempt or female slaves were not, you know? He made sure that everybody knew that both sexes of slaves were, were uh, free. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. Interesting. Well, I think unless um, you've got any particular comments you'd like to add, if I think we could round this off. Um, and I think I just recommend to the audience that they do have a look at buildings like Stabbrook, um, Stabbrook building, and also maybe um, one of my favorite buildings in Georgetown. Um, gosh, the City Hall? No, not City Hall. I love City Hall. The one where we were Andrew's Kirk? No, not Andrew's Kirk. The one that we always go and stay in that's near uh, Moray House. Oh, you're talking about Carol Lodge? Carol, is it Carol? Oh, Carol Lodge. Carol Lodge. Cara Lodge. Cara Lodge, yeah. Yeah, that's another very beautiful building. And I, I, I can't remember when that was built. Maybe um, around for a while. Was that? Maybe around because it was, I know for a fact, I used to go play that basketball in that yard. And in fact, it was there in 1927 the Prince of Wales visited. Yeah. So I know it's been around for a while. Yeah, the Forshaw, Mr. Mr. lived there, didn't he, originally, before the tapes correct. came there? Correct. Mm. So you think it was probably built in the 1930s? Oh, no, it goes back to the, it, it's a Dutch, I'm sure it's a Dutch building, Greg. I'm sure it's a Dutch originated oh. building, because it goes back to Forshaw, the mayor of Georgetown lived there. Oh, and exactly. then later it was taken over by the Tate family, so it became, it was known as Woodbine House. <clears throat> Carol was obviously a later, later name. So... I've got a feeling it dates back to the almost to the mid 19th century, probably. Yeah, I guess it must do because of the Tate family with her. That's about the 1860s, I think. Oh, no. That's right, yeah. Yeah, because there's some very fine photographs taken in the 19th century when the Forshaws lived there. Mm. And you get a very good example of what a, Victoria interior, a Victorian in, interior looked like at that period. Yes. Can I say in columns, they were another roof, or another floor above? With wrought iron work. Yeah. Was do you know mm. was the wrought iron you know because there's a lot of use of the wrought iron was it was it imported or I guess in in as a complete piece or was it actually um, melted down in in uh, in Georgetown do you know? I, know, I think it was imported. Well, some uh, came. Maybe, maybe you like to make a comment on that. Well, I was just thinking in terms of the. Uh, law courts you know like all that wrought iron that's used um in the structure was would that have been imported into guyana or would it have been made on location it was probably it's probably a mixture of both i would say because i mean wrought iron obviously i mean there are obviously foundries in georgetown but whether they did that sophisticated work they had these victorian pattern books where people would look at the pattern book and i think scotland is a firm called mcfarlane's in scotland who produced a lot of the iron work for Guyana. Because, Bert, you remember the famous um, fountains in Main Street? Mm. That's right, that's right. They, they came from McFarland. They were actually designed in Scotland. And I think the firm still exists, apparently. And if you look through the old pattern books now, you can see exactly the same patterns of fountains which got sent out to places like uh, Georgetown. So I think a certain amount of work was obviously done. It's a whole, in fact, truth is, it's a very interesting subject to study. Mm. And I wish somebody would really grapple it and get get take it to task because it's quite very interesting. Because most of the iron must have come to Ghana as probably as ballast when the ships came back empty, mm. Mm -hmm. and um, a lot of it may have come as parts. But I think it's, so it's a mixture of both. So I think somebody needs to sit down and carefully do a study on the iron work in Georgetown, how it got here, what it was used for, etc. Because it's it's an interesting topic. Interesting, in fact, you know, Sprostons who built the city hall. Frosted had a foundry even in those days. So they could have been done doing a lot of work as well. But I think one of the things that impressed me most, the City Hall building is the guttering. And all the other time work came in from England. You know, and I think that if we read it to rehabilitate it, 
you could actually rep, but you're supposed to be pledge hearing. I don't know. True foundry called uh, ba Basif, Brass Cast Iron Foundry, owned by a guy by, I forget his name, he passed away the other day. Yeah, because the Sharples buildings are one of the few bu domestic buildings that have got lots of ironwork. And it's believed he imported a lot of ironwork into the country. I think it even, even lost a lot of money because he imported quite a lot of the stuff and he never really used it. And if you look at all the Sharples houses, they're all distinguished by the iron staircases. That's right, that's right. But each house had a pair of solid iron staircases, which I don't think any other building had in Ghana really at the time. So a lot of it, I think he imported directly. Okay. Well, I think, I think, um, is it an hour and a half? Yeah. Goodness me, <laughs> that's a long conversation. Thank you so much um, to both of you, especially Bert, thank you for joining us. Um, and it's fantastic to see a little bit of light shining through the window. We're all, we're both very uh, envious of that. And um, I hope you'll actually be able to join us live on the day. Um, so on the 28th, um, you know, because I'm sure the audience will have, have a, a lot of questions for you. And um, you, we've had a lot of people sign up already. So hopefully we'll see you on Sunday. And Wayne, thank you, thank you. Of course, you brought a lot of information and knowledge to the conversation as usual. Um, so yeah, thank you both very much. Thank you, thank you, very much. thank you very much, Bert. Nice to see you. It was great going through with you again and worth repeating sometime again and hopefully in person. I think what we need, as you probably know, what you need to do again is to take people around on foot to see these buildings, really. It's all very well talking about them as we are now, but unless you literally do the footwork, and see for yourself. So I think the great thing to encourage in Georgetown, particularly on the tourism side, is to get people to walk through the city because that's the only way to see and appreciate what you what's there to be seen. So thank you very much. And thank, thank you, Ron and Juanita, for organizing this and look forward to seeing it later. Okay, perfect. Thank